well, I shouldn't confess this, but um, I was at a conference with the Society of Women Geographers a few years ago. We were out at a Silomar, uh, which is, as you perhaps know, a conference center with any number of buildings. Uh, well, it was really quite hysterical to see ladies from the Society of Women Geographers with their maps trying to figure out where the dining room was. <laughs> When uh, Lincoln, before Lincoln began speaking at Cooper Union, he asked a friend uh, to sit in the back, and if he couldn't be heard back there, would he please put his hat on a cane and wiggle it so that Lincoln would know how to speak louder. So if anybody in back is equally equipped with a cane and a hat, <laughs> please act accordingly. Uh, I've written about Lincoln's other White House at the invitation of Richard Moe, the president of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Uh, he had liked the inclusive approach I took in my first book, If This House Could Talk. Uh, Lincoln's uh, Springfield, Illinois home was, as, Dick, uh, as um, Bob mentioned, one of the 28 historical sites I chose for that study. After a two-year uh, nationwide search, for houses that would best serve as metaphors to illuminate major themes in American history. I included Lincoln's house in the same chapter, which I titled George Washington Didn't Sleep Here, with uh, John and John Quincy Adams' creaky but marvelous old house in Quincy, Massachusetts, uh, and with James Madison's elegant plantation house, Montpelier, in Virginia. Uh, my aim was to argue in that chapter that, in all likelihood, none of the four would be electable today. The two Adamses, because they told us, um, despite our claims to the contrary, that we really, uh, they told us exactly what they thought, uh, which despite our claims to the contrary, uh, we really don't want to hear. Uh, Madison, because he had no charisma, a weak voice, a tiny hundred pound body, always dressed in black, no heavier than a butterfly, someone once called him, and Lincoln, of course, because of his lifelong struggle with depression. You remember what happened to Tom Eagleton. Two sharp treatments and he was off the ticket in a matter of hours. <laughs> the National Trust uh, decided in the late 1990s to take on the restoration and preservation. And I make a distinction between those two words, and if you'd like me to make it later, I will do so. I've been chastised any number of times for using them incorrectly. But the trust has taken on the restoration and preservation of the endangered cottage, endangered cottage on the soldier's home grounds that has been most closely linked by tradition over many years to Lincoln and his presidency. Needless to say, I was intrigued by the potential of a study of this unknown but highly significant site. For years, the cottage was called Anderson Cottage. Now it is officially the Lincoln Cottage, and with several acres surrounding it, the site is now formally called the President Lincoln and Soldiers Home National Monument. Mary Todd Lincoln ha had put a picture of that very cottage in the Lincoln's family album, and a year after Lincoln's murder, she'd written to her dear friend, the Washington socialite Elizabeth Blair Lee, quote, how dearly I loved the soldier's home. And I little supposed one year since that I should be so far removed from it, brokenhearted and praying for death to remove me from a life so full of agony. But Mary would live 17 more tormented years, and I described her sad but courageous journey in the book's epilogue. She did not wander mad through Europe, as one television documentarian put it. As she said, I wanted to put an ocean between me and unkindness. Her letters reveal a woman who read voraciously, was an avid sightseer, and of course, went shopping. <laughs> and did she go shopping? I believe I am the only writer to use a recent assessment by two medical historians of the final major medical exam she had in 1882, <clears throat> the year she died. Their new diagnosis goes far to explain rationally her ailment and its bizarre symptoms, which in those ignorant days seemed to most people to indicate insanity. She, in fact, according to their analysis in 1999, suffered from untreated diabetes for years. <laughs> 
It is inexcusable to me to judge Mary Todd Lincoln without considering this report in the Journal of the History of Medicine of October 1999. The insanity file is also an indispensable source for a fair evaluation of her trial and how cleverly she got herself restored to reason within a year. Before getting to the soldier's home and the Lincoln cottage, I felt it was important to go into some detail about the appalling state of the city when the Lincolns lived there, because it's almost impossible today to imagine how awful it was then. I wanted to make it clear why the Lincolns were eager as a family, even desperate, to get away to the soldier's home for as long as they could. For Lincoln, it turned out to be 13 months, an astonishing quarter of his presidency. Their son, their favorite son, Willie, had died in the White House in February 1862 of typhoid, probably from polluted Potomac River water, which was then pumped into the White House. John Hay got malaria there, and Lincoln got a mild form of smallpox there. He said at last he had something to give everybody. <laughs> Nathaniel Hawthorne's description of Lincoln for his Atlantic Monthly article on Civil War Washington was so scathing it was removed from publication before publication. But he astutely had noticed that Lincoln's, quote, complexion is dark and sallow, betokening, I fear, an insalubrious atmosphere around the White House. Washington in those days was called the City of Stink, and the White House was located in arguably the worst possible place in town. Benjamin Brown French, Lincoln's exuberant commissioner of public buildings, whose journal I recommend to you, wrote some of the most graphic, even sickening descriptions. And I'll read you a little bit. I know Bob Willett is a killer on time, but I want you to hear what French had to say. There is a soap factory southeast of the president's mansion, the stench from which, when the wind direction is southeast, is almost unendurable at the mansion. Mrs. Lincoln has complained especially about it. The Washington Canal is the grand receptacle of all the filth of the city, the waste from all the public buildings, the hotels, and very many private residences is drained into it. Unless something is done to clean away this immense mass of fetid corruption matter and corrupt matter, the good citizens of Washington must during some hot season find themselves visited by a pestilence. And John Hay added his two cents worth as usual. The ghost of 20,000 drowned cats comes in at night through the south windows. <laughs> Uh, it was so clearly in a menacing location that just one year after Lincoln's assassination, in fact, a site next to the soldier's home, three miles northeast of the White House, was proposed for a new executive mansion. From its great height, quote, it will be far above all malarious influences, said the engineer's report in 1866. I also wanted to remind people of the more complicated vision for the country's future that made Madison, Jefferson, and Washington hold out for this problematic location against 15 competitors, a choice that Lincoln must have pondered more than once when the capital seemed doomed. Cynics today argue that it was because the founding fathers wanted to make a killing from their land holdings along the Potomac. If that were the case, James Madison wouldn't have done very well. He had only 500 acres to sell and half interest, a half interest in the land at that. If you have been to Lincoln's home in Springfield, Illinois, and I'd like to know how many of you uh, have been to Springfield, Illinois. Uh, good. Well, this is, as you know, the only home <clears throat> he ever owned, but you will have felt the presence palpably there in the tranquil atmosphere of Mr. Lincoln's neighborhood. The one the four square block area that the National Park Service has painstakingly refer, uh, returned to its 1860 appearance. So it is at the soldier's home, even with the tall residence halls that have been built now to accommodate the thousand or more veterans uh, who live there today, males and females. <clears throat> and interestingly enough, 400 came up from Gulfport, Mississippi after Katrina. So the place is really loaded to the gills. The trust and the, Air, uh, the Armed Forces Retirement Home, an independent federal agency which manages the site, um, want to preserve that evocative feeling. <clears throat> this is ironic in a way because when Lincoln was up there, he was surrounded by the cacophony of war. It was truly an embattled retreat, I call it. 
1,800 mules parade nearby, <clears throat> dead soldiers being buried or exhumed daily in the military cemetery just down the hill from the cottage, troops, supplies, and ambulances moving day and night up 7th Street, even the frequent war of cannon in the distance that both Lincolns wrote about. I give ample evidence of my view in the book that the soldier's home was also a security nightmare. I call it Lincoln's Achilles heel. It was deep in the country, reached through winding narrow roads, edged by woods, pitch dark at night in an area infested with gorillas, as one worried visitor put it. <clears throat> to Lincoln, the trip was worth the risk, if for no other reason than the fact that the site was and still is today 10 degrees cooler than downtown. The trust architect explains that there is also a kind of natural air conditioning in the cottage, which the trust may try to utilize, in fact, once the cottage is ready for visitors in September 2007. A multi-million dollar restoration of the exterior of the cottage was completed last spring. The facade is very impressive, but it's a sure bet that Lincoln didn't notice or care. He called the White House that damned old house, even though his house in Springfield could have fit into the East Room. Now the trust focus is on preserving, notice I use the word preserving, not restoring, the interior. After Lincoln's time, it was used as a residence hall, an administrative offices, an infirmary, even a bar at one point. So determining the, um, the uh, layout and decor in Lincoln's day has been challenging. But even so, even in the still empty rooms, you can clearly conjure up Lincoln, reading aloud to guests in front of the marble fireplace in the parlor or descending exhausted down the staircase in the foyer to meet guests demanding to see him at all hours of the day and night. Literally, that's true. Midnight, even. One bunch showed up. There are wonderful descriptions of his appearing at the top of the stairs in his nightshirt, holding a candle to light his way down, only to retreat when he discovered there were ladies in the party, <clears throat> or sliding asleep off the sofa as late-night visitors imposed upon his seemingly inexhaustible patients. As much as 85% of the original fabric of the cottage is still there. The jib windows, the pine floors, the marble mantles, seven of them, I think, some of the stair treads Lincoln even walked on, the, the balusters, perhaps even the railing. It really is a magical place. The history of the cottage and its ironies is worth noting. Twenty years before the Lincolns arrived on June 13, 1862, George Riggs, a wealthy Washington banker of late lamented fame, partner of William Corcoran, had built it in the new fashionable Gothic revival style on farmland he'd bought on one of the most beautiful, fertile hills in the area. Riggs had grown tired of the financial risks Corcoran relished. But by 1851, he'd become tired of country life. He and Lincoln shared at least that view, for he was very much a Lincoln hater according to his granddaughters. And although Lincoln deposited his paychecks faithfully in his bank, Riggs would never receive the president in his house. A Riggs' daughter had died at the villa, ironically enough, so he packed up his family and returned eventually to the city, this time with his own bank and a huge house near the White House. Both Lincolns had rushed out to inspect the soldiers' home just days after the inauguration, but 1861 was just too chaotic to consider such a retreat. Mary Todd Lincoln just left town, and Lincoln was totally besieged in the White House. By the time they got to the soldiers' home in 1862, the Riggs cottage was much larger, expanded from Riggs's six rooms to at least 14. The U.S. government had bought it from Riggs for $58,000, along with 256 acres. The prime movers in setting up the former Riggs property as the first asylum for wounded and homeless veterans with booty from the Mexican War uh, were General Winfrey Scott. So old and infirm by the time the Civil War began, he had to admit, quote, if I could only mount a horse, but I can't. <laughs> Along with Robert Anderson, uh, later of uh, later Fort Sumter fame, and Senator Jefferson Davis of Mississippi, Lincoln's, of course, Civil War nemesis. Well, to the critical question, what does the soldier's home reveal about Abraham Lincoln? What does it add to our knowledge of a man who is still described by historians as elusive, an enigma, a mystery? I'm reminded of Churchill's description of Russia. You remember, a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. 
the most shut-mouthed man about himself, said his partner, William Herndon. The Lincoln Cottage is the only site left <clears throat> in the country with the promise of offering fresh insights into his startling physical appearance, his unusual temperament, the idiosyncratic character of his leadership, and the intensity and breadth of his political and personal relationships. It is, Richard Mull argues, the most important Lincoln site in the country. He knows he's going to get uh, an argument from Springfield, but uh, he maintains that it is the most important Lincoln site in the country, the only one honoring his presidency, as Bob Willard alluded. Back in um, 1958, historian Richard Curran wrote a great book called The Lincoln Nobody Knows. Years later, in a 1999 essay, he concluded that Lincoln was still the man nobody knows. I made a list of over 100 conflicting adjectives I came upon during my research that scholars and others have used to describe the 16th president. These do not include the, quote, clashing political perspectives cited in the new Fourniere Deutsch study or his military prowess. I was certainly incapable of judging that. But here are a few contradictory assessments of his character. Vain, humble, subtle, simple, passive, ruthless, tender-hearted, merciless, ugly, handsome. Frederick Douglass said he had a home-like beauty. Jovial, melancholic radical, conservative, uncouth, high-minded, vulgar, saintly. Carl Sandburg wrote that Lincoln was, quote, both steel and velvet, hard as a rock, and soft as a drifting fog. How does, it, does the soldier's home help us out of this man nobody knows dilemma? Happily, powerful eyewitness accounts of Lincoln at the soldier's home turned up during the trust research, and I found more. I use these extensively, as well as reminiscences of Lincoln at the soldier's home made in later life. The witnesses range widely. We have the observations of a very young drummer boy, Harry Kiefer, and of a 25-year-old private, Willard Cutter, who wrote well over 100 letters to home to his mother and brother during the three years Company K guarded Old Abe and the Madam, as Cutter called the couple. Add to these the writings of the well-born and educated Henry Heide Cooper of Meadville, who organized Company K in that Pennsylvania town and ended up a general minus an arm shot off at Gettysburg. Or the 1865 observations of George Bard, an English lawyer, who came to the soldier's home late one evening in 1864, prepared to scoff, but who left deeply impressed, which was a typical reaction on actually meeting Lincoln. Quote, sit and talk with him for an hour, Borat wrote, and note the instinctive kindliness of his every thought and word and say, if you have ever known a warmer hearted, noble spirit, one of the great historical characters of this century. Frederick Law Olmsted, who headed the U.S. Sanitary Commission at that time, had a similar conversion, and even Charles Francis Adams did eventually. There are the accounts of Private John Nichols, the man who found Lincoln's hat with a bullet hole in it and who told of Lincoln sitting down for breakfast with some of the newly arrived famished men from Company K who had no idea they were to be the president's guard for the next three years. It was, in fact, kind of a snafu that they got to the soldier's home at all, a typical snafu. The recollections of Rebecca Pomroy, the family's beloved nurse, who cared for Willie, for Tad, and for Mary after her carriage accident, which may have been sabotage, and which affected her health from then on, according to her son, Robert of astute Sergeant Smith Stimmel, a fearless young rider in the elite Ohio Light Guard Company that rode with Lincoln or tried to in 1863. When I say tried to, I mean that Lincoln managed to escape his guards as often as he could, leaving the soldiers home ahead of schedule with the escort madly scrambling after him. In the chapter Achilles Heel, I raise some speculations as to why Lincoln was so careless with his, of his safety. One of the truly heartbreaking remarks that Mary Todd Lincoln made after his murder was when she said toward the end of the war, she and her husband believed, quote, they had passed through five long, terrible, bloody years unscathed. She also said at another point that if they didn't get him at Ford's Theater, they would have come to the White House and got him there. These accounts and the many others I use are very revealing, too, about the quality of the Lincoln marriage. The picture I paint is a positive one. There is one particularly poignant image from their life at the soldier's home, how Mary would stand in her nightgown and cap at her bedroom window, watching her adored husband leave for the White House, wondering always whether or not he would come back alive. 
and I defy you to say they were not a compatible couple when you consider that Lincoln dared to write to Mary on one of her trips that their son Tad's pet goat had been found on the boy's bed upstairs in the cottage chewing his cud. <laughs> Sergeant Charles Derrickson of Company K told Ida Tarbell, Lincoln's first great biographer, that he found Abraham and Mary in bed together one morning when he'd gone to wake the president up. Uh, being young, I should imagine that this he didn't keep this to himself, which may have accounted, in fact, for the rumors during the war that Mary Todd Lincoln was pregnant. Of course, the most significant historical event at the soldier's home is Lincoln's working there on the final draft of the Emancipation Proclamation. In the chapter, Lincoln and Freedom, I cite the evidence that makes the cottage in the words of one scholar, quote, a legitimate cradle of liberty. My book is the first to publish a marvelous 20th century painting uh, of Lincoln in his favorite item of clothing, a nightshirt, working on the Emancipation Proclamation at the soldier's home, which was lost for 50 years but found just in time by Barb Willard to be included in my book. I also describe in some detail, I was urged to do this by several scholars in Washington, um, I also describe the black communities Lincoln encountered in the contraband camps on the way out to the soldiers' home, the staff at the White House and the cottage, the multitude of free black enterprises in Washington that he and Mary would have passed on their afternoon carriage rides around town. The fact that historians for 140 years neglected the importance of the soldier's home in Lincoln's life and presidency isn't surprising when you consider other blind spots in Lincoln's studies. Lincoln's 20-year law practice was ignored for until about 10 years ago with the ambitious uh, legal, uh, Lincoln Legal Papers Project. Mary Todd Lincoln's rehabilitation has finally begun, and I'm happy to do what I can to help it along. So I decided it would be fruitful to use the soldier's home in at least part of the book as a kind of prism through which to explore aspects of his presidency and character that have been slighted. Some of the 75 visitors we know at this point to have visited the soldier's home provide the hooks I needed. In the chapter, Lincoln and the Tools of War, I deal with Lincoln's fascination with weapons, as evident, evidenced by his conversations at the soldier's home with the inventor of a new shell, John Amsterdam, with a slightly shady arms dealer, Orloff A. Zane, with the indefatigable Admiral John Dahlgren, jo General George Ramsey, and others. There has been no full-length study of this uh, aspect of Lincoln's presidency uh, since Robert Bruce's book in 1956, 50 years ago. The technology Lincoln was interested in reads like a 21st century armory. Machine guns, he was the first to purchase machine guns. He called them coffee mill grounds. Rockets, submarines, aerial reconnaissance, and of course, the ironclad that changed the course of naval warfare for, uh, forever. It's jarring to read of the compassionate Lincoln saying, I won't leave off until it fairly rains bombs or to General Grant, hold on with a bulldog grip and chew and choke as much as possible. A touching, vivid story of Lincoln and the Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, untangling their boy's pet peacocks from a tree on the Smith soldier's home grounds turned up in Louisiana archives. So I devoted a chapter to Lincoln's relationship to Stanton, who sometimes stayed in another cottage there because there hasn't been a biography of this controversial, generally detested figure since, 18, since 1962. I describe the close relationship between the two men that developed eventually, despite an excruciating for Lincoln, first meeting in Cincinnati years before. Stanton called him, I believe, the long-armed ape, which he, whom he ignored totally. After they had grown to respect and rely on each other, Lincoln said the man's public character is a public mistake. He is utterly misjudged. I don't see why he survives, why he is not crushed and torn to pieces. You may know that wonderful story. Someone came in to Lincoln and said, Stanton just called you a damn fool. And Lincoln said, he did, did he? Well, he's usually right. I'll have to go and see him about that. <laughs> I also explain the political context of Lincoln's favorite storytellers that he liked to read to guests at the cottage. Writers usually just quote the character Artemis Ward's awful piece, high-handed outrage at Utica, or the corny stories of Petroleum v. Nasby, wondering how Lincoln could have liked what Stanton called damned balderdash in his comma moments. I explain why. Nasby was a character created by a journalist and was described by a biographer as the most important factor in Union victory after the Union Army and Navy. 
his copperhead bumbling was an easy target to bolster Union morale. The essays of the character Orpheus C. Kerr were another favorite of Lincoln. He satirized everything about the war, do good ladies, retreating troops, you name it. Uh, I include his parody of the literary giants of the day in a contest for new national anthem. It, at least, is still very funny. The name of the character, of course, Orpheus C. Kerr, was just a play on the bane of Lincoln's existence in the White House, the office seeker, one of the reasons Lincoln's fled to the soldier's home as often as possible. People criticize Lincoln's habit of stopping to read these works in the middle of crises. I laugh that I must not weep. That is all. That is all, Lincoln explained. They were also his way of making a point quickly. I wanted to give a glimpse of the intellectual climate in the North during the Civil War using the slave poems of prominent writers of the day whose more gentle works we all got to memorize in school. We know that Lincoln liked Longfellow's poems and Longfellow admired Lincoln, but I at least had no idea that Lincoln and John Greenleaf Whittier were abolitionists or that Herman Melville wrote Civil War poems. I have a chapter on their poetry. Who knows how these poems on slavery might have influenced the evolution of Lincoln's thinking on emancipation. Lincoln's fervent admirer Walt Whitman wrote a beautiful poem, pensive on their dead gazing. Ends the, this ends the chapter, and it is heartbreaking, especially in today's context. I chose illustrations for the book to broaden reader's appropriation, reader's appropriation of the appreciation of the important artists of Lincoln's time, Winslow Homer's Civil War sketches, which uh, catapulted him to fame, the 19-year-old sculptress, Win Vinnie Ream's full-length statue of Lincoln in the Capitol today. I thought it would be interesting to show Stanton, Lincoln, and Grant not in photographs, but in one of the era's favorite parlor decorations, the Rogers Group. Walt Whitman once said that no photographer, <clears throat> no painter of their time was up to, the, uh, up to the challenge of painting Lincoln. He said you'd have to go back two or three hundred years to find a painter who could do that. And looking at a couple of Rembrandts at the Metropolitan Museum a few weeks ago in New York, I said, aha, Rembrandt is the guy who could have painted Lincoln and done, justify, done justice to him. I also use the visitor's home for another purpose. They serve to bring into sharper focus some little-known elements in Lincoln's temperament, his lack of a sense of beauty, for example, or his unromantic nature. He was not the easiest of husbands. It is impossible to imagine Lincoln writing to Mary, as Stanton did to his wife, I, my thoughts dwell on you with unutterable love. Even if all those letters he wrote to Mary are ever found, it's unlikely they would contain anything so effusive. Lincoln's Secretary of State, William Henry Seward, who boasted that he rode out to the soldiers' home at all times of the day or night, wrote to his wife, I wish you could be in the grounds this bright morning. The chestnuts are in full bloom and there is a humming of bees. The, chest, the foliage uh, it like, is like uh, the music of a distant waterfall. I watch the development of vegetation with a lover's interest. Lincoln, on the other hand, once admitted to some ladies he met walking on the soldier's home ground, matter-of-factly, I know all about trees in light of being a backwoodsman. I'll show you the difference between spruce, pine, and cedar. He preferred trees without their leaves so he could see their anatomy. He couldn't tell the difference between pink and blue when I met him, said Mary Todd Lincoln. And Lincoln confessed, I have but a dull sense of the beautiful. As a student in a rugged school, I have through life been excuse me, obliged to strip ideas of their ornaments and make them facts before I conquered them. Euclid was my cornerstone, and the few flights I have taken in eloquence have never carried me out of sight of that hard basis. What began in a narrow necessity remains a habit. One final thing to note in the book, its tendency to emphasize the heroic rather than the villainous. It's not a pathobiography, as historian Jean Baker calls the focus on the negative and the neurotic. There's too much of that already. I remember Paul Volcker talking about the ever-present corruption during the Civil War. When I asked him if he couldn't think of something positive to say, he tried hard, but he couldn't. But listen to this quote <clears throat> about one of the characters I highlight in the book, Quartermaster General Montgomery Meigs, one of Lincoln's closest advisors and a soldier's home visitor. Secretary of War Stanton was so confident of Meigs' ability, he said he'd sign his name at the bottom of a piece of paper and Meigs could write above it what he would. General William Tecumseh Sherman felt the same. The handwriting of this report is that of General Meigs, he wrote, and I therefore approve it, but I cannot read it. 
I'm not a Pollyanna. I mean, there were really some heroes in the war. Uh, Stanton's, some, I think four or five of his assistants died of overwork uh, during the war. Uh, but I'll, there's more of that in the book. Uh, historian Current concludes that you have to come to your own conclusions about Lincoln. And I hope, of course, this book will help you create, form some thoughts based on this fresh evidence from the soldier's home. As for me, I found Lincoln there an eccentric, and Jean Baker says, I'm the only person who's ever called Lincoln an eccentric. I'd like to know if that's right or wrong. I found him a tough, tough, but magnanimous, egalitarian, visionary genius. But I wonder what he would think of us. Are we fulfilling our responsibilities to preserve and protect what he gave his life for, the last best hope of Earth? Thank you. Okay, we'll have time for questions, but I want to, before the first question, I want to uh, do a slight impression. Y you get everything at this symposium. Uh, the impression is of uh, Scott Sandage, our missing introducer, last year talking about inviting questions, and he described his experience with someone from a prior symposium. He said, the person got up and said, I have a comment and a question. My comment is blah, 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 blah. My question is, what do you think of my comment? <laughs> I'm going to ask you not to make those sorts of questions. As Scott said, if he doesn't hear the inflection at the end of the sentence, it isn't a question. So with that, I'll, I'll invite questions for Elizabeth. I'll try to answer them, yes. Okay, take the mic, please. I must confess that I have a comment and a question. Uh, but the comment has the virtue of being brief. Uh, my roommate from college and I decided to go out to the soldier's home one time about five years ago. And we drove out. When we arrived, um, the uh, guard, uh, and when we told the guard what we were doing, he s said, you came out all the way, all this way to see that? Seeing my Virginia license plate, I suppose. <laughs> Uh, but he did graciously let us to see it. He said, since you've got to go in to turn around anyway, if you want to take your time, it'll be okay. So, so I, I'll just say that by way of indicating how glad that, uh, that uh, things have, have are, come, are going to change. Question, I don't definitely where, uh, which cottage was the one that Lincoln used. I was a, yeah. a, 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 I, I had come yeah. to understand that it was not. Well, uh, during the, the the fact that the picture of the Lincoln Cottage is in Mary's uh, album, family album, uh, we felt was a fairly severe, serious indication that this was the house that meant most to them. Uh, during the research uh, that was given to me after uh, when I was asked to write this book, uh, there was a brief reference to them moving from one place to another. Uh, the trust hasn't tracked that reference down. It's, it's, they're very confusing references uh, to, the to the possibility that he lived elsewhere, and the trust is not ducking that. They just haven't really found anything definitive. But again, th long tradition held that the cottage that they're now restoring and preserving is the place, really, that meant the most to them and where they spent most of the time. The other, of course, uh, things, that, that copper beech tree, you remember that the great stories developed about Lincoln sitting under the branches reading poetry or sitting on the limbs with Tad. Um, the tree fell down a year or so ago, and they did some uh, analysis, and it turned out that it was too young to have been on the ground. Um, during Lincoln's time. So that, unfortunately, was a lovely story that is now um, no longer valid. Does that help answer your question? Yeah. It was quite a shock, I must say, when a researcher found that particular line about, about moving. But uh, the, the restoration, of course, preservation, uh, 
let me tell you the difference, as I understand it. Restoration is what they've done to the exterior. They tore down the porch, the double porch, to make it the single porch that was in the picture in Mary's album. Uh, they they uh, totally redid the roof and the stucco uh, sidings. That's restoration. That's back to Lincoln's 1860 uh, period. The inside, they're not really taking down to the paint or the wallpaper, whatever it was when Lincoln was there. They're preserving it. And in fact, the trust is only going to put back three rooms to the way they think they might have been during Lincoln's era. As you'll see in my book, descriptions are very, 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 very um, minimal about the furniture and the, uh, the, the rooms, very minimal. So we have very little evidence. Uh, the other rooms are going to be used for exhibitry. Then, of course, there's going to be a visitor center in the building uh, next to it. And eventually, it's hoped that there will be a scholar for Lincoln, a, a center for Lincoln scholarly studies. So they have a long way to go. But the place will be open for visitors in September 2007. They've committed themselves to that date. They do, however, because they really want to preserve the tranquility of the grounds, however unlike they might be, they might have been in Lincoln's day, as I said, because th the veterans want it that way. And um, so th I think visitation will be limited somehow, a control, shall we say. Um, but obviously, they'll, I, I think they expect between 25 and 45,000 visitors there each day, each, each year when they, when they are finally open. Yes. Wait a minute. You need the mic. Hello. Yes. Hello. Yes. Thank you. There's a bit of a to-do going on right now about the selling off of some of the mm. acreage out there. Yeah. In your opinion as an historian, um, do you believe that would um, interrupt the aura of the acreage as he enjoyed it, um, well, or, or the views yeah. from the acreage into the city? Well, uh, the views that he had no longer exist, as I said, because of these huge residence halls that have been, I mean, you can, you can walk out of the Lincoln Cottage and some of the windows, you can see some of the city as he would have seen it. Um, uh, but uh, the, uh, on the sale, my understanding is that they are not going to sell land, they're going to lease land. And uh, I, frankly, myself, personally think it's a pity. And one thing that really is quite gnawing, I think, is to think they have to do it because they need money. Uh, soldiers every month are a tithe 50 cents from their paychecks to help support the home. But I find it really rather sad and pathetic, in fact, that we can't figure out some way of of uh, helping this, the Armed Forces Retirement Home f finances so they don't have to do that. Uh, because as far as I can see, the descriptions of what might be going up on some of the land, you know, their hotels, residences, uh, it's going to, I think, make quite an impact um, on at least the periphery. I, I hope that the, the, the ma monument comprises two plus acres. And so I think within that uh, parameter, perhaps the atmosphere will be preserved. And the, eventually, they want to bring the landscape back to the day it, the way it was in Lincoln's day. They want the historic landscape to be returned. So uh, it, you know, it should be OK if you just sort of put blinders on. <laughs> um, but again, uh, one of the reasons they were so glad the Gulfport, Mississippi veterans came up uh, from after the hurricane was because this was going to add to their coffers. But can you imagine just 50 cents a month? You know, it's, it's really, really sad, I think, indication of, of our priorities. Any other questions? Oh. What, what can you see if you visit the site now? Uh, uh, well, I, I'm not sure uh, 
how close you can get, in fact. You could certainly see the exterior, uh, but there are guards at the gate, at the Eagle Gate, which is the main entrance, and I'm not sure what their criteria are. I know I've brought several groups up there um, for tours, uh, but that was when the interior, we could get into the interior. It's now a hard hat area, so I would say that nobody can go inside unless you have some special arrangement. Uh, so uh, I would say that it would be prudent perhaps so to wait until 2000, September 2007. But uh, I could find out for you if you would like. There was a couple of other questions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I, think I had a question. Uh, you made the comment that the area was a security nightmare, that it was infested with gorillas. Uh, I'd like to know more about that. Well, read my chapter. <laughs> uh, well, you know, Maryland, I mean, one of the, uh, Willard Carter, this wonderful uh, soldier whose 100 plus letters are really just invaluable material. I mean, he talked about a spy. They caught a spy within the first few days they were there to guard Lincoln. They caught a spy on the grounds. There was a farmer who had an apple orchard, and the boys, they knew he, he hated Yankees, and so they were going to go over some night and steal his apples, you know, to get back at. Them. Maryland, you know, was certainly uh, a very problematic uh, state for, for a long while in terms of its support. And, of course, uh, there were many, a uh, number of Confederate attempts or plans to uh, kidnap Lincoln and take him right over the border and into, you know, eastern Maryland, which was certainly sympathetic rebel territory. So it was, uh, it was really an extraordinarily dangerous place. Ha John Hay even added to it by talking about all the drunks and prostitutes and so forth that were on the way out, uh, at least, uh, you know, while he was in the city. Take one. One more. I, I think just uh, uh, in 60 seconds or less. Is this on? Yeah. yeah. Uh, my name is oh. Frank Milligan. I'm the relatively recently directed, uh, appointed director of the Lincoln Cottage. And uh, just in 60 seconds or left, less, I could shed some light on a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, it's uh, quite probable, as Elizabeth uh, outlines in her wonderful book, that the Lincoln family indeed did not stay in the cottage in uh, 1862 that we're restoring. In fact, stayed in one of the two stone buildings adjacent to it, uh, one of which I live in now. Uh, and Stanton lived in the other one. Uh, I also, as I point out to the staff, uh, in a sense that's in, in a way quite irrelevant to the importance of the site. The family did stay in the, Lincoln, in the Anderson Cottage in 1863 and 1864. Uh, secondly, as far as the access to the site now goes, uh, we are moving into a construction phase. It is a hard hat area. However, we did um, invite, I think there were 30 or 40 members, uh, at least participants today, who were out there yesterday. Uh, so being part of these sorts of groups does get you on the inside in a lot of ways. Uh, but we'll be putting up perimeter fencing within the next couple of months, and then it really will be quite a, uh, a place that will be out of access until September 22nd, uh, 2007. And I don't think I have to tell this group why that date is the date we're choosing to open. I will rule that that was definitely not blah, blah, blah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Elizabeth.